Jaya Prabhuji. Hello, welcome to the Retro Progressive Yoga Institute. My name is Swami Omkarananda. I am a disciple of Prabhuji since 1997. And in this institute, I share my understandings and my reflections on the writings and teachings of Prabhuji. In this opportunity, I am reflecting on the book Tantra, Liberation in the World, in which Prabhuji shares how this path enriched the spirituality of the world and particularly his own path. Of course, the retroprogressive yoga path of Prabhuji is enriched with many different uh, wisdom and insights of the cultures and religions of the world. And definitely Tantra has a very warm and special place. Tantra is a very practical way to approach life, reality, our passage through this dualic realm. And Tantra has a lot to teach about how to relate to our body, to our energy, to our relationship with the beyond, and to uh, the devotion that it's expressed in a very special way through this path. This is the course number four. This book is extensive. It goes thoroughly through the different stages of the revelations, giving an amplitude of details about each development, sect, chronology, rituals, the type of members that join the different sects and different times, and what uh, each stage in the evolution, because this revelation is not giving one time and frozen in time, but it's an alive revelation and it's developing and enriching as people get enlightened following this path and bringing new flavors to this revelation. Of also the scriptures were developed over time, were revealed over time, and practiced because Tantra is a practical revelation. It's a deep soteriological um, revelation that um, invites the followers to merge with the divine and to merge within themselves all the polarities. So the, the internalization of the search towards the origin is a move that brought so much richness, so many sampradayas, lineages of disciplic succession that learned a specific agama, practice the ritual system suggested by the agama, uh, reflect on the metaphysical uh, purposes that it brought, and ultimately realize the essence of the scripture and pass it on to the next generation. So this is how, although again, against all odds and against all the attempt to destroy these traces of wisdom, we can somehow taste and enrich ourselves from it. And this is what Prabhupada tried to do in this very complete and comprehensive book. We are doing a series of courses. This is the course number four, in which we focus on the stage of the Ati Marga, uh, which were a group of ascetics, Shaiva ascetics, Bhakta ascetics, devotion, the de devotees of Shiva, that dare to experiment with new types of uh, ritual practices, um, moving a bit the the boundaries of what was accepted back then as orthodox spirituality. And this is how they open a torrent of new ways to connect to ourselves. In last class, we study about Bhairava, which is the main deity in the Atimarga, which is a stage that we call pre-tantra, because still the Agamas were not revealed, but we believe that many traces of what the uh, seekers of the Atimarga plant flourished later on in the Mantra Marga, or better known as the Tantric Revelation, because Tantras are the books. The books, the Agamas, are also called Tantras. Now, in the moment of the 
in, in the moment of the revelation, the main worship was given to Bhairava. Uh, even in the Atimarga stage, and Bhairava in, and his many different incarnations, so emanations, will be the one who will give the Tantric revelation. He will be the revealer of the wisdom, together with his consort, which will be Bhairavi or the goddess in many, many different aspects and ways that, because the book gives us not only details, but also with the iconography and the illustrations that are intriguing and fascinating, we will learn this in later courses. Um, we learned about Bhairava. You are welcome to, to go there and learn more about this fascinating deity, the fearful uh, Bhairava that is coming to release our uh, ignorance and ourselves from the false identification of the ego. And today, I think it's important before we go on and learn the particulars of each sect to understand better in the context of this time, what is the meaning of ritual and sacrifice? What actually the, the revelation comes to give is a new way of ritual to reconnect with the divine. So it's a, it's a ritual system. It's a system of practices in which ritual is a very central part. I was thinking that we inherit and perfectionate many discoveries of our ancestors, starting from the fire, how we perfectionate to have, be able to have electricity today, or the wheel, when they invented the wheel, it was a big discovery, how we perfectionate to have uh, cars and uh, airplanes, and how we perfectionate the agriculture in a way that we can multiply and flourish and, and uh, de develop uh, in this world. But the rituals and sacrifice was a very, very central part of their life, is what kept them maybe going with this connection to the mystery. And the way that they relate to it, the way that they dedicate their life to it, the importance that rituals and sacrifices had in the lives of our ancestors. But somehow, I see that this is one of the fields that we decline over, over time. And we, yes, we develop m much more comfort and advancement, but we are more um, hungry on the aspect of our connection to the beyond. And it's painful and it's pitiful. And, um, and maybe, you know, we increase our well-being, but not sure our sense of meaning, sense of connection understanding about what we are here to do and how to live our lives. So I feel that when we go back and revive and think about, because we, I don't know if everybody, but I hear that there is some also sense of, wow, what a primitive society, how, how much they dedicated to, to this type of, of things with a waste of time. And I felt that we, we, we couldn't take, as, uh, as we evolve as humans, these treasures of the rituals and make, deepen them. And with, you know, the evolution of the ability to, we have that we have access to so much information to try to perfectionate our relationship with the mystery, with the hidden part of, of life. And we focus very much on the manifested part, which are the sensory experience. But we know, we know that there is a lot hidden. We know that a lot, there is a lot that we don't know. We know that we are not eternal. And therefore, this or the ritual aspect of our lives come to bring to the center of our life the big existential questions and all this uncertainty that we have it finds a way to canalize and to, to make this flourish and, re and ultimately realization, self-realization. So it declined and now it's practically non-existent in modern society. So whoever keep the ritual, although no mainstream, I think that it keeps something of the flame because this might be a temporary disease 
of deep and forgetfulness that we are suffering and these things may revive. I can tell you that in the retro-progressive yoga, this, uh, the rituals have a very central part. And in the development of Prabhuji, is is uh, extremely central. From our deity puja that we do daily, from all the initiations that Prabhuji went through in his life, so much around the these treasures that we have, which are the rituals of the different cultures. So today we will learn more about what are rituals and in our next class we will deepen into what are sacrifices. Let's get started. What is a ritual? Rituals are symbolic actions, ceremonies or prescribed sequences of activities performed in a consistent and often symbolic manner. They can encompass a wide range of behaviors, gestures, words, and objects. Rituals typically serve to mark significant events, transitions, or moments in a person's life, community, or religious practice. For example, weddings, worship, religious holidays. So rituals have a very deep symbolic components. They symbolize something, they come to reflect some principles, some values, some connection with our higher self, our inner reality, or we can call it God. So the, the, the ritual is not usually invented is not a technology. A ritual is inherent from those who can feel what type of actions, words, precision, objects can in a way symbolize whatever is hidden in the plane that is manifested. Prabhuji dedicate a full book to explain the significance of the symbol and the myth in our lives and soon we will taste a bit from that book. But basically what he says there is that a symbol is that which unifies whatever is hidden with whatever is exposed, whatever is unmanifested with whatever is manifested. So through and in a manner that is visually perceivable, but in order to understand it, you need a narration, an auditive experience, an explanation, a myth, a tradition. So a symbol is something extremely valuable. It's a treasure because our lives is, are full of symbols. But these symbols, these holy symbols, give to our life meaning, a purpose, a deepness, and eventually marked and give us direction where, where to go through if we want to increase our happiness, but happiness is eventually this reconnection with our source. So the, the ritual is, is an act full of symbolism. And the symbolism, in order to understand what everything means in, in this ritual, we need to, to hear this, hear this from our um, ancestor, from our previous generations, and the rituals are originated in those who see, who see the beyond, who are awakened, who are enlightened, who are, have this mystical experience that they can they cannot give the experience, somebody that experienced the beyond, it cannot explain what it is because it's before the words. It cannot show it because it's the origin of the senses. It cannot take us there because it's a, an act of disappearance of every difference. But what he can do is to find a way to symbolize it. So in a way that the symbol, because the symbol is union and communion and unity, it will allow us to unify with, with that that the symbol symbolizes. And this is how we find 
fascinating ceremonies and rituals and sacrifices in different cultures that they come to give us a hint of the beyond coming from the prophets, from the enlightened beings, from the, um, the mystics that in their generosity and in the connection with the beyond, they try to make it palpable in some very symbolic way because by that we can taste a bit of the direction and then you know the ports of the of the beyond can open to us so we can cross them with the help of this door that are the rituals. Let's learn a little bit about how the rituals manifest in different religions. In Hinduism we find the puja, the worship, which is a ritualistic worship involving offerings, prayers and devotion to deities. We also find the yajna, which is a fire sacrifice. Those are rituals involving the offerings of various substances into a sacred fire, symbolizing purification and transformation. In Judaism, we find the Shabbat, which is the weekly observance of rest and worship from Friday evening to Saturday evening. And we also find many other rituals. Just to mention one, we find Passover, which is Pesach, which is a ritualistic meal commemorating the Exodus from Egypt. In Buddhism, it came to develop its own type of rituals that usually are very introspective and they are involving meditation, which is practiced to achieve enlightenment and inner peace. We find less daily worship, they, don't, uh, they reject in a way all the ritualistic system, but yet we have rituals of veneration of Buddha, which are offerings and prayers to Buddha, Bodhisattvas and monks. In Christianity, we also find many rituals, just to mention a few, we have the baptism, which is the initiation into the Christian faith through water immersion or powering. And we have the Holy Communion, which is a ritual involving the consumption of bread and wine to symbolize the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In Islam, we can mention the Shaun, which is the fasting during Ramadan, that their fast from dawn to sunset during the holy month of Ramadan. Another ritual worth mentioning is the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is a mandatory ritual for Muslims who are physically and financially able to undertake it. We see how the same principle is expressed in different religions following their different cultures and environments and in the time that the religion develop, and many times a, a religion come to give an alternative, an alternative way to the previous one, and to renew and to enrich. And the, in the, all these religions we see the heavy and deep symbolic significance of these rituals. So I want to bring one paragraph of the symbolic term, the book written by Prabhuji on this topic, just to get a bit of his attitude toward this. Knowledge of myth is the key to Pandora's box, liberating the understanding of origins and granting the power to weave and shape the destiny of entities. This knowledge is not limited to a merely external or abstract understanding, but is experienced and lived ritually, both by ceremonially narrating the myth and by performing the ritual that finds its justification in it, an intimate connection to such knowledge is attained. The symbolic term by Prabhuji. Myth have been important and central in every culture. We tend with our modern mind to disregard myths, thinking that they are histories, fantasies, primitive, um, naive. And I think this is the big gift that Prabhuji gives with the symbolic turn, explaining that uh, the importance that the myth and the ritual expression 
of the relationship with that myth gives in our lives with our relationship with the beyond. We can be smart, we can be comfortable, we can be modern, but how disconnected we are from whatever is not available to our senses. We made from science our modern religion, thinking that our answers will come from it. And the science has nothing to tell us about whatever is beyond the senses by definition. To be scientific, it needs to be able to demonstrate and to perceive. And we're speaking about the imperceivable. It's uh, the ritual come to connect in this symbolic way the relationship, and Prabhuji says here, and this text has a big context though, so in the context of what he's explaining here, is that we feel helpless in our understanding of the world, with our minds, and in our relationship. But through the myth, in a way, we can know the secrets of the unknown, and connect to the origins, to, the, to whatever is um, beyond this experience of being an independent and separate entity. So by doing that, reconnects the, the entity to the power of the entity itself, which is the power of awareness. And by being able to, to reconnect to the awareness, you give back the ability to decide and to control your life, instead of being disconnected and at the mercy of the imitation that we do from others, which is our animalistic nature, or to whatever is expected from us, by this connection to our inner wisdom, we can reconnect with whatever we have to do and whatever will give us fulfillment and put us in tune and in harmony with our deeper nature, inner nature. Now, how this connection seems being done? We have the myths. Every culture is uh, inherit their own myth, expressed usually in their holy scriptures, and given a system of ritual which will allow you to come in contact with these mythological figures, to in a way develop a relationship and getting closer to this, that it's not there, and this Prabhupada expressed again and again, it's not somewhere there in the sky. This is not the attitude of the retro-progressive yoga, but it's your higher awareness. It's your true self. This consciousness that pays attention to everything you do and is a, a, a disconnection from, a, from yourself that lets you think that you are a completely independent and a, separate entity. The ritual is the way to reconnect to the beyond. Now, why ritual is so important when we come to understand the Tantric revelation? What the revelation came to give is a new approach to rituals. It's a new way to relate to the unmanifested. And it was a non-Vedic way. The Vedic way was the established orthodoxy and the Tantra came to give an alternative. And all the book, what it explains is the development of this alternative that in fact came to bring a different way to connect to, to the divine. And by doing that, it opens the gates of spirituality to many people, to many um, different ways to connect in a way free the, the seekers from the uh, chains of the orthodoxy that everything evolve in the everything has to evolve and also the, the way to connect to the divine should evolve and this is what was like a blessing from the sky to, to bring down this revelation that it was more relevant for the modern human beings and it was a way to uh, connect that is very, very close to our, to our experience. It's not to um, imagine some uh, legendary myth, but it's to come back, 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 back very close to yourself, to your very experience of being human, to deal with your desires, with your sexual urges, with your inclinations, and by reconnecting to the 
awareness that lies in you, that, that um, is just operating you, and by reconnecting to the awareness that dwells in you, is said that the Shakti, the energy that operates you, reconnects to the awareness that watch everything that happened, which is Shiva. So the Tantra came to reunite the uh, dynamic aspect of the divine, which is you and everything that happened in this dualistic plane, and Shiva, which is the unmanifested, the awareness, the unchanging eternal. Where they can meet? In you. You are the perfect shrine for this meeting to happen. And this is how all the external practices, they become very, very internalized. And this is how uh, Prabhuji incorporated this amazing wisdom of the Tantra also to practice this uh, inner, in the work with your inner energies, with your chakras, with your uh, tendencies, and to, by, by bringing the awareness of Shiva, to liberate the conditioning of this life. Now, what this uh, revelation had to do? To shake a bit the, the status quo. And therefore, it was not a mainstream. It was back then an esoteric, esoteric approach to, to, the, to the search. And it was reserved for the few that were brave enough to, to undertake this, that they were serious enough to break the uh, acceptable norm. So let's see in brief the stages in which the ritual in Hinduism was changing over the time. Ritual in Hinduism. It's believed that start like 3500 before the current era until it was put in writing in the 1500. Um, those first scriptures put in writing a very ancient and powerful ritual system and they were called the Shruti. The Shruti because these scriptures were heard. They were meticulous, detailed and sophisticated ritual systems that we call them the Shrauta rituals because it's coming from the Shruti. It, they include Vedic Yajnas, exoteric rites, duties and beliefs. And by exoteric, I mean that it was open for all the Hindu society. The Vedas came to give the ritual to all, divided in four different castes. Uh, the Valanashrama system that divide the responsibilities uh, of the society in four aspects and the four stages in life. Every stage will be uh, accompanied by its own ritual duties and beliefs. The Vedic rituals were called Yaknyas and in the Shruti text they provide the guidelines for Vedic rituals including elaborate ceremonies like fire ceremonies, high recitation and ritualistic offerings to deities. These rituals are conducted to maintain cosmic order and seek various worldly and spiritual objectives. It is said that the Shruti was heard, but not composed, was heard from the beyond. And it was put in writing not by, by authors. There is no authorship to these scriptures. They were received by revelation from the beyond. The Vedic ritual is sophisticated, is so detailed and meticulous that is said that no human being can, can even imagine. It's, it's such a, a complex ritual system. In order to perform them, the Brahmanas had to study and memorize the Vedic hymns from childhood and specialize in different types of rituals to be able to perform and to activate the powers of the ritual by the repetition of the Vedic mantras. Usually, these uh, rituals were performed in the open, in nature, usually dedicated to different gods in the myth mythology, in the pantheon of the Vedic uh, scriptures. And these gods were usually in charge of these uh, different forces of nature. Now, this Vedic system, over time, declined. 
And the reason is that the society advanced, the circumstances changed, and in order to be able to hold that such sophisticated ritual that had to be practiced accurately, accurately, otherwise not only will not bestow the benefits required, but also it might um, lead to the opposite results. So that this ritual was the central, the center of the Vedic life, but they had to be sponsored usually by kings because they were costly, they demand a lot of time dedicated to it, a lot of study, a lot of material. If they, can, they, are, they were Vedic rituals that can last up to a year. So the, the, for, for when it was six, a very special uh, uh, circumstances, so the king will sponsor this year-long sacrifice that will give him eventually the purity that he required to be a good king and to be a pious king and to lead their uh, kingdom to protection and to, to flourishment. So over time this couldn't hold uh, the system so it was replaced by the Smarta system and let's study about it. The Puranas are a part of the body of scriptures called Smriti or remembered. These scriptures are um, put it in writing the tradition that passed through generations uh, received from the ancestors. They are not considered divine revelation but the inherent tradition of the spiritual aspect of the Hinduism in which all the myths that were heard from the ancestors are put it in writing. So they had authorship and the authors of course are rishis, enlightened beings, the prophets of that time, the mystics that they can put uh, in writing this uh, accurately with their um, divine connection. Now this Puranic brought a different type of ritual and here we see a change in the practice of spirituality which is the Smarta rituals. The Smarta rituals usually include Homa which were fire offerings and Puja which was a ritualistic type of worship. The Smarta rituals we had different uh, streams within Smartism. We have the one who worships Shiva, the worship of Vishnu, the worship of Ganapati. We have different uh, different type of Puranas that uh, explain the myths and how to praise and how to satisfy different deities. And in these rituals, the narrations, as we said, uh, we, we learned in the symbolic turn, the narrations are repeated and the ritual comes to explain and symbolize and, and have an active way to connect to these uh, unseen realities and by doing that elevate our consciousness and reconnect to our source. So this it was in a way the simplest version of the Vedic. It was not, it didn't come to oppose the Vedas. It came to simplify, to do it more doable. This is how we see the emergence of puja, which was the ritual instead of nature. And these long and sophisticated and very detailed rituals were, were simpler forms of puja, of homa, that can be performed in the temple, that can even be performed at home with a deity that, that take care of the every house had its own deity that can be the protector of the family so this relationship with the mystery was not only part of the life maybe the main part of our lives for this it can be more important than that we also see a change in the attitude towards these rituals in which the emphasis was put in devotion it's in a way the bhakti um, stage in which bhakti develops. The, the, the mythology from the Vedic pantheon, we see the, the Puranic pantheon is more anthropomorphic. We can relate to these 
uh, these gods in a way that we can identify with them. They have relationship, they have couples, they have kids, they have stories, and these stories come to teach us the different values and different aims of life. And the, the worship from being done in nature, it's now passing towards a temple in which we can worship in a context of the house of, of the gods. And also uh, at home, there was also possible to, even if I don't have the budget for a Vedic ritual, to perform a smarter ritual to my Ishta Devata and enlarge and deepen my relationship with it. And uh, I do this in order to clean my karma, to accumulate good merit, eventually to be pleased with the objectives that I have in life, to be grace from the gods, to achieve my goals and to live a righteous life. Pre-tantric Atimarga. Those were the esoteric sects in which they practice kaula rites in cremation grounds. They use impure substances. They develop the yogini's cult. From within this society based on devotion, based on Paulanic worship, we see the emergence of ascetic cults, and this is the Atimarga. They were individuals that for them, this in a way mellow uh, worship was not enough. They said, yes, it might clean your karma, yes, you might accumulate good merits, but if you want liberation, that ritual system, it's not enough. You need a more powerful system. So in a way they came against the, Ved the Puranic or Vedic culture. They came to challenge it, but they didn't come to challenge in a way that they said, this is nonsense and I will reveal against it. The opposite. They said that is not enough. We need, in a way, we lost something in the way and we need to enlarge it. We need to be more committed to this if we really mean to clean our karma and end this circle of life and death. We cannot do it at home, in our free time, combining with our many, many mundane goals. We need to go all the way. And those are the sects of the Atimarga that we're focusing in this course. Those were the ones who left everything and went for an ascetic life dedicated completely to rituals and sacrifices. What they brought, it was revolutionary in a way. It was a, a culture, they call it the culture of the cremation grounds. They said, you know, our life is temporal. Death is more real than life. So instead of worshiping this benevolent aspect of the divine, they went for the distracted destructive aspects. They went for the worship of Bhairava, frightening, deathly, decorated with skulls, angry at the human beings, ready to destroy everything, angry because we forgot, angry because we put so many other pleasurable experiences higher than the one and only purpose of our life, which is the reconnection with the beyond. And this is how they undertook penance and dedication and sacrifices and discomfort and they brought a new type of ritual. The rituals influenced by the cult of the yoginis that they brought the... the yeah, we will dedicate a full uh, class about the cult of the yoginis that they brought these elements that they not only uh, bring prosperity but shake the conventional state of consciousness, allowing and opening the seeker to alternate states of consciousness, allowing to touch that ecstasy, that mystical experience, that magical powers that will allow him to break free from illusion. 
and they notice that if they take the same norms of the Vedas that they follow for thousands of years, we will not break free from the conditioning because this conditioning can be mundane but can be also religious. And they notice the, uh, the barriers that this fear from experimenting with prohibited substances and they challenge the norms of pure and impure in the Vedic context. And this would make them unacceptable. They were criticized, they were esoteric, they, they didn't want this uh, knowledge to be spread because they attract so much animosity from the establishment, from the orthodoxy. So they kept their practices in secret and they were looked upon with despise because of the, they were daring. Now it was together without, with that, it was clear that they were, in the, the first sex were all Brahmanas. They were the best of the best and they made this choice following certain Shatipat, certain awakening of energy within them that brought them to the next stage. So they were seen and as holy men, but they were also criticized and people were fighting, oh, as, as we, we see very often when someone is bringing the truth too close to our eyes so the society can react in a way that, you know, diminish this effort, just not to face that, yes, we forgot the divine, yes, we are too engaged in our egoic pleasures, yes, we are in ignorance and we don't do enough. So these examples, examples that are exemplary seekers that come to, to dare to seek more, those were the Atimarga Shaiva ascetics. The Tantric Mantra Marga. In this stage, we see the revelation of the Agamas that brought a very detailed and different type of ritual. They brought the mantra, the Tantric mantras and the Yantras. We see this is a kind of specialized ritual that intended for a reconnection to the Shrauta. It brought a higher soteriology and it aimed to infuse the seekers with divine power, with the Shakti. It was meant not only for ascetics but also for householders to perform rituals in the temple. The Tantric revelation was literally an earthquake for the established spirituality. It influenced all the orthodox established religions. Why? Because it brought a very practical set of rituals that lead the seekers to self-realization. It was so powerful that every established path was influenced by its new methodology. It was a new type of ritual. It was a different way to see the divine. It was a different way to approach the mystery. This is how we see how it influenced the Shaivism of the time that was more devotional, more smarta. We see how the Vaishnavism took the technology of the uh, tantric ritual to change their way to worship. And not only that, it went further to influence Buddhism, which was, as we learn, uh, by definition, the Buddhism came to be a system without rituals, with inner uh, introspection, but yet it couldn't be indifferent to this revelation. And it incorporated many of the wisdom into their own Tantras and Agamas creating a new branch of Buddhism, Brajayana Buddhism, the path of the, the way of the diamond in which there are rituals and there are deities and there are manifestations of the beyond and there are yantras and there are mantras and this is what we see today as the Tibetan Buddhism. Even Jainism was influenced by the Tantric revelation. So what it brought is a new aim, a new aim 
to, to aspire. And it can be thought that it comes to, to, to be a rebellion against the orthodoxy because it goes an experiment with forbidden substances. But if you ask the own tantrikas, they will think that it's a more specialized type of ritual. And many of the tantrikas that they were, most of them householder, because they, uh, the tantra was in a way domestication of the practices of the Atimarga that were meant only for ascetics and whoever was a householder was kind of, uh, he couldn't follow it, the, the, so demanding the path of the asceticism. But it was domesticated in a way that every household can benefit. And by worshipping the divine couple, which is the Shiva and Shakti, in their different manifestations, they are in a way reproducing their own lives of a family, of a male and female living instead of in the temple that the deity living in their house so they can connect to the divine by identification. And the, the Tantra brought the Tantric mantras, that this is the main difference. They stopped using the Vedic mantras and they brought these uh, magic formulas that were the powerful mantras of the Tantra, that they were nothing less than the sonoric representation of the deity. So in a way, by repeating the holy names, you are associating with the essence, with more subtle essence of the daily. So all these teachings, when they were revealed, they were revealed esoterically, meaning if you wanted to be exposed to them, you needed to go through an initiation, and diksha, that will allow you access to these techniques. And then your master, that had to be enlightened because it's a transmission, it's, it's a path of transmission of a, experience, it's not a theoretical path, it's the Shakti itself, it's the energy self that will be given by Shakti path through the enlightened beings. So you are exposed to a more specialized type of worship. So many of them saw this as a continuation, as a, a, a worship that you add to yourself on top of the worship that you are committed through the society, whatever is orthodox and accepted in the Vedic. So, so they not, we should not see these uh, seekers as uh, rebels against the Vedic system. It's more like the super ritualistics, the ones that were, were able to do more sacrifices for this very important relationship because they, they put more energy and more attention in their inner search, in their inner journey, in their connection to the beyond. Non-dual Tantra, the stage of the Kula Marga. In this stage, we see a fusion of the Tantra and the Kaula. We find a domestication of yogini's practices and a focus on aesthetic eroticism and sexual union. The way that the revelation was unfolding and the influences of the different lineages that appear within that were developing, we see the emergence of the Kaulism. This lineage started by Matsyandranath, and we will study in depth because he played a so significant role in the later development of the revelation, which took all the practices of this extreme ascetics, Shaiva ascetics of the Atimarga, and he adapt, adapt these practices to the householders. The Atimarga influence some sects of the Mantra Marga, and those sects afterwards influenced by the Kaulism, the lineage of Matsyandranath, he took these treasures really that he inherited, that were enriched from the Atimarga a system of the Kaulas, from the Tantric system of the Mantras, and he domesticated in a way that he cleaned all the mortuary elements that were really a barrier for, for the most uh, uh, seekers of that time, and he just focused on the aspect of Shiva and Shakti 
and even it was a path that was not meant for celibates because the sexual union played an important role in the uh, mystical experience. And this is how we, he made the kaula, the kaula initiation, the kaula ritual, after he experienced it, Matsi Andranath is considered almost an incarnation of Shiva that co came to reveal the Kaulism and the Kula Marga. And this is how we see the many sects that develop in the stage of the Kula Marga, which were towards non-duality, the union and the merge of the polarities. So, and then, of course, uh, we have with the stage of the exegesis with, with Abhinavagupta that took all the treasures and combined this in the path that he calls the non-dual trika Shaivism. We will dedicate also a course on that. So, to summarize, we see that ritualist is a dynamic development as people experience and can canalize and transmit the path to, to the beyond, we see how the system goes and enrich and, and changes and influence and evolve to make it more relevant and more available to our search, to our times. In modern days, we have the surviving Hinduism. The Vedic system didn't survive as it is. It's not applicable to the modern man. The uh, system that survived, we see the smarter system that survived, influenced very much by the techniques brought by the Tantricas. And then what we have today, in a way, it's a merge of all these rituals in what we call the modern Hinduism. But the, what I feel when I read this book is, why I wish that in the modern times we have more room for this importance. We are kind of, don't put it, the relationship with the divine in the center of our lives. And therefore, we are not more happy, we are more busy, more confused, more uh, um, lost. And what I feel by seeing the example of Prabhuji, that, that his life, his life is his relationship with the beyond. That's all what is, is passionate about all type of ritual. That's why we learn all the type of ritual. And we practice rituals from different religions because he cannot have enough of rituals. He's, uh, in a way, he said it's my weakness because it's so fulfilling and so fascinating for him that he wants really to practice all and to be engaged in all. But um, at least in this book, we can taste something from his passion to, to ritual and to to this uh, symbolic way to connect to the beyond that it opens, opens, prepares us, opens us and, and really leads us to a proper condition for the revelation. This last Friday, in the late night, we were in Prabhuji's room and he asked me, what are you busy with? What are you studying? And I shared with him that I'm preparing a lecture on the topic of ritual and sacrifices. And in, I feel it was a rain. It was a very rainy day. It was an autumn day, very, very rainy. I felt a rain of blessings that start like nonstop bringing all the different scriptures and different insights and wisdom and, and treasure. It was, in a way, I was so overwhelmed, it's, it was a lot to absorb and I was trying to stay open and try to absorb because when Prabhuji reveals, it's really the revelation, it also connects you to something of this wisdom. So one of the things I want to share with you from the many, many things that he, he, he brought is this verse from the Bhagavad Gita that says, Patram Pushpan Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktiya Prayajati, Tand Aham Bhakti Uparita Ashnami Prayatat Manaha. If one offers to me with devotion a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or even water, I will accept that item offered with love by my devotee in pure consciousness. Bhagavad Gita, 
926. And then Prabhuji went on to explain the symbolic meaning of this verse and said the following Patram. Patram is a leaf. Krishna doesn't have enough leaves. Why you need to offer a leaf that Krishna itself made? But offer a leaf represents the offering of all what comes from you, all, all your offspring, all, all the things that you created. I offer them back to Krishna. To Krishna. Patram Pushpam. Pushpam is a flower. A flower what is the purpose of a flower on a tree, he said? For what is a flower? A flower really only gives beauty. So offer to Krishna all the beauty that you express. Return to him. The flower comes from him. Give it back to him. Patram pushpam palam. Palam, it's fruit. The fruits of the tree are symbolizing the fruits of your actions. Don't relate to yourself the fruits of your activity. Don't assign to yourself the results of your actions. Offer to Krishna the fruits of your actions back to him. Patram pushpam palam toyam. Toyam is water. Water. Krishna doesn't have enough water. Why he does need you to offer water? Why does it need to do with flowers, leaves, water, fruits? He is the origin of all the universes. Why you need to offer him something so simple? And then he said, Yome Bhaktiya Prayachati. And this is the main thing. Krishna doesn't need your leaves, your water, your fruits your flowers. The only thing that Krishna doesn't have is a devotion. This is your, the choice of your heart and this is the only condition for the offering to be accepted because the division in the, of the devotee and Krishna is a artificial division. There is no real division between the lover and the beloved, between the soul and God. There is union, but the purpose of this apparent division is to be able to create a loving relationship. So you can focus your attention of your fruit, the fruits of your actions, and assign to yourself the beauty of your activities, or you can have the bhakti, the devotion, and, and realize that actually I am not the source of all this. I am an expression of the divine. And therefore I choose to offer all the, all the beauty that comes from me back to the divine with devotion. The devotion is the condition for these uh, offerings to be accepted. And then, if Krishna reciprocates in the way that he gives back and please the devotee back, it's not a business. It cannot be a business that we interchange our offerings, the offerings of our ritual. And here Krishna defines and explains the ritual. Offer me leaves, offer me incense, offer me flowers. This is the ritual. If you do it with the purpose of receiving results, this is not done with devotion. By definition, devotion is the, uh, the thing that you do without expecting any results. So when Krishna says, Ashnami, I will accept if it's offered with devotion in pure consciousness, if it's done with awareness. I, 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 I don't need all these material expressions. The only thing that the separation can offer to the whole is the attention, the devotion, the orientation, the intention. Prabhupada speaks lately a lot about intentionality, the intention to relate. Prabhupada explains 
the, the divine donates itself, the things donate themselves in your experience. And the way to meet with the one, with the, 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 the realm from where the things are donated, the realm of reality, is to turn your intentionality back, back to the source of all your experiences that in the Bhagavad Gita is represented symbolic, symbolically by this uh, deity of Krishna. So what you have to offer, basically, is your intention, is your devotion, is your love, those things that only you can offer. Krishna doesn't have. Because by, by creation, you are separated from this. So your choice to turn back to the divine without uh, expectations, there is when Krishna says, Ashnami, I will accept it. I will receive it. And I will reciprocate as he explains in the verse 411 in the same Bhagavad Gita said that I reciprocate my devotion, the devotion of my devotee accordingly. Accordingly, he do one step, I do one step, I reciprocate. So if we are curious for the mystery, if we want to go one step forward, the ritual is a bridge that allows us to focus our attention towards the source of ourself. I don't want to give it names in the different religions and cultures. They give it different names. But in the retro-progressive yoga, we are not about the verbal names, but the level of awareness. Prabhupada more called this mystery consciousness, because it's something that you experience consciousness right now. You are conscious, you hear, you are conscious. So it's not a, a matter of achieving. And if I focus on the on the teachings of Prabhuji is that there is no technique. The ritual is not a technique to achieve the divine. The ritual is an expression of your love, of your intention, once we realize the bliss of this unity. And if you pay attention, every step you, you go towards integrity, towards unity, towards seeing the, what unifies is a step towards the direct experience, the experience of that everything is one. So the ritual is just an expression of the of a celebration of that devotion, but it's not a currency that through which you will attain something else, because that will only deepen our separation. A ritual is a celebration of the unity of the awareness with itself. So this is just a bit of the many teachings that Prabhuji gave in context of rituals. I hope to continue sharing more of this in the next class. So thank you Prabhuji for giving back to us this taste and this uh, attraction towards the developing this relationship with ourself and with the mystery of the divine. We will meet in the next class. Jai Prabhuji.